I was working in a marketing job Friday of the first week of the new job. I returned to work from lunch and started to feel very strange, just dizzy. I was seeing and experiencing less detail. Time seemed to slow down. Instinct took over. I felt like an animal that fear was coming in. I just thought I need to hide and lay down on the ground to protect myself. And suddenly the whole right side of my body was shaking vigorously. I told myself, go to sleep and it will all be over. And then I went unconscious. The first seizure triggered a whole bunch of stuff from one seizure to many seizures in the same day, to being admitted to a hospital, to the awareness that there is a mass in the brain. So I had a brain surgery. It was nine hours long. After three months, the entire brain tumor grew back. I had to have a second brain surgery. I usually refer to it as brain surgery 2.0. Okay, this is a challenge, and if I can deal with this challenge, I could probably do anything. So I already had a blog going when all this brain cancer stuff went down, and I decided to go from private to public and share with everyone what was going on. I didn't start writing with an audience in mind. It was really easy at the beginning to write about brain cancer stuff because I would just write about what I was going through. When I realized other people were reading this besides my friends and family, people wanted to know what it was like to have brain surgery. So I would reflect back on what was that day like? What would someone need to know to prepare for the brain surgery? I have met so many people with brain cancer and I've heard so many stories and because the brain is such a complex organ that the side effects and losses, but for those who are lucky enough to still be alive, are diverse and different and not one of us is the same. I have many friends who have brain cancer that are no longer with us that I think about often. I think of friends who say, I can no longer see anymore. So when you look at the world, look at the world through my eyes when I can't be here. And I do that. I struggle with how I should be involved in this space moving forward. I love meeting other people with brain tumors. I know I might lose those friends in the future. I struggle with how important is it to be there for those people who have questions versus future heartbreak for me and potentially losing friends and being there for people wins out every time. This is my dad. Three months ago, he died and I have yet to shed a tear. Before you feel sorry for my loss, let me paint a picture for you. Except for the baby in this photograph, my dad abused everyone you see here. He was a cheater, a corrupt maker of deals in all things in life. He was the kind of man who only did things for people when it was to his advantage. And after my parents divorced when I was two, he never paid child support. In fact, he almost disappeared from my life completely. I can count on one hand the number of things he did for me, both as a child and an adult. He profoundly let me down in every way that matters to a daughter. I was 29 when I was diagnosed with brain cancer. My dad visited me a total of one times. He also never called me again. 
He also never sent any cards. And a few years later, he declined an invitation to my wedding. My whole life, I kept waiting for him to be the dad I deserved to have. But two years ago, I had an epiphany. He was never going to be that person. So I decided I would stop talking to him. And while he would always be my father, he would never be my dad. So that's what I did for two years, until one day last fall, when I received word that my dad had been diagnosed with, of all things, a glioblastoma, the most malignant form of brain cancer, with a five-year survival rate of less than 5%. This is the same diagnosis that was given to Senator Ted Kennedy, composer George Gershwin, and Delaware Attorney General Bo Biden. This is also the same predicted trajectory for my own diagnosis. You see, science insists there are no known causes for brain cancer. And this has always been and continues to be a source of serious frustration for me. So when I found out about my dad, in an instant, I became, we became outliers among outliers. And in that moment, I decided to break my silence and re-engage with my father. Now, I'm a big nerd, and in the last few years, I've been keeping up with the latest in brain cancer research. So when I found out about my dad, I knew to call Baylor College of Medicine and enroll us in Gliogene, a global study looking into genetic links in brain cancers. I also decided to engage myself in my dad's care for two reasons. One, despite the past, my mom and my siblings wanted to help my dad, and I knew they needed my help navigating their way through this complicated and nuanced disease. But really, selfishly, I got involved for reason number two my extreme curiosity over how much this disease may be related to genetics. The scientist in me wondered if the same biology I carry in me, beyond the abandonment by my dad, may have manifested itself as cancer. Gliogene's preliminary findings are promising, but due to high mortality rates, it's hard to find families who qualify because both family members need to still be alive in order to enroll in the study. Oddly, my dad's cancer has made me feel more empowered than ever before. For the first time, I realized my own genetics might carry powerful stories, or at least lead us one step forward in that moonshot toward answers. In the end, my dad was cared for by the very people he hurt and alienated throughout his life my feelings for him remain unchanged. My whole life, I kept waiting for him to be the dad that I deserve to have, for him to give me his support. Just having my back would have been enough. But in his final days, he gave me the greatest gift of all. His cancer made me more aware of my own mortality. It raised questions sparked curiosities, and forced me to ponder thoughts I would have never before considered, such as how I will handle my own end stages when they come. This person who gave me almost nothing in life somehow gave me something more with his death. And it is for these things I am thankful. So you do not need to feel sorry for my loss. Thank you. Thank you.